Hello, Philosophy 102. Um, we're moving past fallacies. Uh, in fact, we're moving past fallacies and cognitive biases and rhetoric and all the things that you're not supposed to do in good critical thinking or logical argumentation. So up until now, we have focused on what not to do. <laughs> We've defined some words and expanded our vocabulary so that we can discuss these things, uh, discuss what is an argument, what isn't, why that difference is important. But up until now, we've been talking about what not to do. Chapter 9 is a pretty big deal. It tells us what we should do. So this is when we begin looking at good arguments, when we start looking at the structure of deductive logic, when we start talking about how to construct valid arguments or strong inductive arguments. We're not to induction yet. I hope we make it. Uh, but if we end with deduction, I'll be happy with that too because it's an incredibly powerful tool. So just to refresh your memory, as I've warned you multiple times, uh, we definitely need to remember those properties of deduction that we went over in our earlier lectures. So remember, deduction is certain. It produces certain conclusions. When I say certain, I don't mean specific ones. I mean 100% proof positive certain conclusions unlike induction, which is probabilistic. So we use a different vocabulary to talk about it. When we talk about deduction, we talk about validity. Remember? So validity is a property of the structure or the form of the argument, as is invalidity, right? And we've been using these terms and talking about them and building to this moment, this moment on page 242, uh, of the textbooks. We've worked really hard to get here, so let's not forget everything we worked on as we made our way to this point, because we're going to put all of the things we learned about deduction together to start learning how to do it properly. So, this first chapter is, not this first chapter, this first chapter of deduction is not my favorite chapter, specifically because it focuses on categorical claims. Now, this is an interesting kind of thing, categorical claims, uh, and specifically categorical syllogisms. You all will have heard me talk about these two things, specifically with regard to the fallacy we covered last week, uh, the fallacy of the undistributed middle. And I promised you that we would go over it in the future and it would start to make more sense. That time is now. So, syllogisms are just any two-premise argument. Well, two-premise, one-conclusion argument. That's a syllogism. It's just a fancy name for that type of argument structure. It's very common. Most of what we look at as we move through deductive reasoning will only have one or two premises and a conclusion. Arguments can be much longer than that, but we're going to focus on syllogisms just because we're uh, we're like toddlers in logic right now. We're just starting to make our way into walking and we'll run by the end of it, but it'll take some time. So don't be too intimidated by this. I really like what our textbook says <laughs> about Sherlock Holmes being a bit uh, hyperbolic here. The science of deduction and analysis is one which can only be acquired by long and patient study, nor is life long enough to allow any mortal to attain the highest possible perfection in it. That would be a bit much for a 102 class, right? I hope you guys agree. That's a lot. It's a bit overstated. As the textbook says, fortunately, the greatest detective was exaggerating in this quotation. While it may be that few of us mortals will attain the highest possible perfection in the science of deduction, most of us can learn quite a bit in a short time if we put our minds to it. Don't be too intimidated by this stuff, guys. It's going to look different to anything you've ever seen before. 
but uh, it's no more difficult in technical terms than addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division with a calculator. I'll even add that. Not doing arithmetic in your head, but it, we're, we're on a basic arithmetic level here. The difficulty comes in learning the new symbols and the new techniques of analysis. Once you've learned those, it's like plugging in basic arithmetic into a calculator. No problem, right? So we've already talked about a lot of this in Chapter 2, specifically deductive inferences. Those are just arguments, right? That's just a fancy word for deductive arguments. Don't be intimidated by it. So it is worth saying, uh, not that anyone's flipping through the textbook chapters, but if you were to scroll through the pages of this chapter, you'd see some Venn diagrams, circles and X's and shading, and in the next chapter you're going to see some weird symbols. Uh, and it reminds many people, I would say, of mathematics. I've gone ahead and highlighted this section because I want this to be what we have in our minds as we go forward. These pages may look intimidating, but there's nothing complicated about them if you keep in mind that each paragraph builds on those that came before. If you try to skip ahead, you may have trouble. In fact, I would go a bit further than the textbook here and say, it's not going to make any sense. It's going to look very weird. <laughs> so take it slow. Understand that, you know, you're learning a new language, right? You may have heard people say that mathematics is a language or even the universal language. I'm inclined to agree with that. Uh, logic is also its own language. Fortunately, our logic, logical vocabulary is uh, pretty narrow. There are very few expressions that we need, and that's part of what makes it such a powerful tool. Uh, it has been the project of many philosophers of language to uh, convert you know, a robust language like English into some kind of logical form that makes more sense so we can't keep making the same mistakes we've made in the past. I'd imagine some of you can think how that would be extremely helpful for scientific claims or scientific inquiry, but it can also be helpful in our day-to-day -day lives. So let's move on. Uh, so you might remember this, hopefully you guys do. I've pushed this point very hard. Deductive arguments depend on meanings of the words that occur in their premises for their validity. In particular, words like all, and, or, and if then. Uh, we talked a lot about the conditional if then statement. Uh, they carry that burden, the burden of structure and validity. So recall also that valid deductive arguments actually prove or demonstrate their conclusion. That is, if the premises of such an argument are true, the conclusion cannot fail to be true as well. This is very important. We need our definition of validity. If you don't have a definition for validity in your notes, I strongly suggest that you add this now. Bookmark it. Do something with it. This is incredibly important, right? We're not using the loose and popular uh, use of the word valid. We are using the mathematical term, right? And valid means a deductive argument that actually proves or demonstrates its conclusion. More specifically, if the premises of the argument are true, the conclusion cannot fail to be true as well. You might be noticing there's an if-then statement right here. I guess I can't highlight it, um, right? Here's the if, and they don't say then after the comma, but we know it's there. So this is a conditional statement. This is a conditional definition, right? If the premises of such an argument are true, the conclusion cannot fail to be true as well. We're not going to talk a lot about whether or not the premises of these arguments are true, because deduction relies on structure, not on uh, the content of the claims we're looking at. So we just say, if these things are true, does it necessarily lead to this conclusion? And by necessarily, I mean it is necessary. There is no way out of it. It is guaranteed, 
right? Another way to parse this is the truth of the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion. It will make more sense why we don't talk about content very much with regard to deduction once we start looking at it, but those of you who recall how I stripped the content out of those fallacious claims we looked at last week will realize that we use those sentence atoms, those letters, to represent the entirety of the content so we can just look at the structure. So what would it mean for the letter A to be true, or the letter B to be true, or P and Q as the textbook uses, right? It wouldn't mean much of anything. So we just take them to be true and say, if they are true, does that force the conclusion to be true as well? If it does, then it is a valid deductive argument. If it does not, then it is an invalid deductive argument. This chapter doesn't emphasize that as much as I'd like, but we'll get to it. Specifically, uh, when we talk about propositional logic, which is a kind of logic I much prefer to categorical. Um, so anyway, like propositional logic, the subject of the next chapter, Categorical logic is useful in clarifying and analyzing deductive arguments, but there's another reason for studying the subject. There is no better way to understand the underlying logical structure of our everyday language than to learn how to put it into the kinds of formal terms we'll introduce in these chapters. This is something that uh, students have brought up to me many, many times uh, as we go over the fallacies, and I try to insist that we stick to the, the claim as it is written in the textbook, right? Uh, we stick to the assignment as it is written. This is because these are written with an understanding of the underlying logical structure of what's being said. We can't just go shifting things around all willy-nilly, right? We want to instead analyze these things as they are. And yeah, nobody speaks that way. It's fairly easy to look at these claims, though, and translate them. That will be another thing we focus on as we move through this chapter, making claims look more like uh, the sorts of things we can analyze using deduction. So I'm not going to look at these first two examples. I prefer these second two examples. Uh, there's some Benedict Cumberbatch being a Sherlock Holmes. Um, instead, I want to look at these two claims. Let's just think about these. They can go in your notes. They don't have to. Harold won't attend the meetings unless Vanessa decides to go. Compare that to if Vanessa decides to go, then Harold will attend the meeting. Are those two sentences the same? Do they have the same meaning? Actually, think about this. Let's say there's a rule written on I don't know, the parchment of the universe, <laughs> perfectly enshrined. It's like a law of physics, that, and it says, Harold won't attend the meeting unless Vanessa decides to go. Right? And the next one, maybe, maybe there's another rule in some parallel universe that says, if Vanessa decides to go to the meeting, then Harold will attend the meeting. Right? What, can we think of circumstances where one of these might be true and the other one might not? So I look at number three, and I think, well, this says he won't do it unless Vanessa decides to go, but it doesn't say that he guaranteed will go if Vanessa goes, right? Um, he, if, if Vanessa doesn't go, he's definitely not going, but Vanessa might go and he might have some other stuff to do right? This tells us the conditions under which he will not go, right? He won't attend the meeting unless Vanessa goes. When we look at number four, if Vanessa decides to go, then Harold will attend the meeting. There's no way out of it. It's, it's written into Harold's DNA. If Vanessa goes, then Harold must go, right? But maybe Vanessa doesn't go, does this say that Harold can't go under that circumstance? Not at all. It just guarantees he will go if she goes, right? 
These are two very, very different statements. And, you know, maybe they seem kind of silly or irrelevant, but you can imagine seeing something like that on an exam for law school, right? Medical school, if you've taken the MCATs uh, or the GREs. Uh, this sort of understanding, being able to look at claims like this and recognize some fundamental difference in them, will be incredibly helpful to you. Oh, I can't underline it. That's tragic. Moreover, we can imagine that these are in fact rules, maybe not about Harold and Vanessa, but about some other conditions, right? Uh, maybe it is a, a lease that you're considering signing, or maybe it is a contract to perform some kind of work. And being able to tell the difference between these two statements could serve you very, very well in life. So in this chapter, and the next, I'd say more so the next, you'll learn foolproof methods for determining how to unravel the logical implications of such claims and for seeing how any two such claims relate to each other. Right? That's what we're doing here. Again, let's not worry about the content. We can change these to X's and Y's. We can change these to P's and Q's, uh, or S's and P's, right? Uh, kind of algebraic expressions, and still come out with a rule that makes sense, right? Eventually, if you take to this method of critical reasoning, you'll be able to just look at these sorts of things and see that they're obviously very, very different statements, and you'll be able to see all the logical entailments of these two very different sorts of statements. All right, let's move on. Right into the nitty-gritty, uh, categorical claims. In logic, a category is a group or class or a population. Those of you who have taken some science courses might realize that a population just means a given group in a given area, right? Um, these all mean the same things. Uh, it's any bunch of things that can serve as a category for our purposes. This might seem silly, but probably we can put this in our notes. Terms are noun phrases like dogs, cats, Christians, Arabs, people who read logic books, and so on. Right? So I've already prepared our notes today, just so I could do some highlighting in advance. Don't get stressed out by that. Um, you know, I thought this would really help, so we wouldn't get these weird fonts, but now we get things being underlined. Okay, so this is our definition for what terms are. This is going to matter, I promise. And let's underline it. Okay. Clean that up a little bit. So, if you're comfortable with noun phrases, this is not a big deal, right? We know that dogs, cats, Christians, Arabs, people who read logic books, incidentally, I am two of these categories, um, right? You can be more than one of these, uh, these terms. Uh, they're just ways of organizing or categorizing things. Uh, we'll talk more on what won't work as a term momentarily, but this is good to keep in mind. Only certain things work as terms, specifically noun phrases. Okay, so these terms are labels for categories or classes or populations, all of which for our purposes are the same thing. There are all kinds of ways to express, express claims about categories, but we are interested in four standard form types of sentences. So we have them all right here, and you may have seen them in the notes. Um, but these are the four types of claims we're looking at. There's an A-type claim, an E-type claim, an I-type claim, and an O-type claim. I realize it would be easier to number them one, two, three, four, uh, but because this logic comes from classic Greek, uh, we keep the names as similar as possible to the original Greek names for these things. So 
super annoying, but look, you only have to memorize four things, right? And it's very, very helpful. So we have A, E, I, and O. And they're sentences that result from putting terms in the blanks of the following. So let's look at this. Um, and be aware we are going to put this in our notes. So all blank are blank is an A type claim. We have an example down below it. All pianists are musicians, right? That's going to be an A type claim. An E type claim, no blank or blank, is going to be an, okay, yeah, I already said that, is an E type claim. And an example is no otter hounds are pianists, right? I kind of feel like, eh. You can give any example that works for you if these seem a bit silly. Um, maybe they do. We can see that these are very different types of claims, right? This is universal about all pianists. This is also universal about otter hounds, but it's specifically saying none. Actually, this is universal about pianists and musicians, which we will talk more about momentarily. But no otter hounds are pianists, right? This is universal about otter hounds. Our next type is an I type claim. Some blank are blank. Immediately we should recognize that some is substantively different from no and all, right? Some musicians are prodigies. Not all musicians, not no musicians, just some of them, right? Uh, and then we have another non-universal. Some blank are not blank. Some politicians are not criminals. They have an asterisk there. I wonder what that leads to. I'm going to go find out. Tragedy of tragedies. It appears my uh, digital copy does not tell me what that leads to. I was wondering if it might be a disclaimer or something like that. That would be very, very cheeky. Uh, Okay, let's move on. So we've got the four types of categorical claims in our notes. And this might seem silly, uh, but if you ask me a lot about this or tell me that you just don't understand this, I will refer you back to this video because there's a beautiful, beautiful structure to all of this that if you take some time looking at these, you will see like unwrapping a present, right? We're only at the first layer here, but I'm going to try to draw your attention to the relevant things uh, that will make the structure of what we're doing in analyzing these claims very apparent to you. So we've got these in our notes, and I would recommend you look at them and think about which ones make universal claims and which ones do not, and what those universal claims are about, right? Because this is going to come back up when we talk about what it is for terms to be distributed. When we really think about this, when, when we say all pianists are musicians, can we start switching this around now and maybe make some statements about some musicians? Right? Can we say the same thing? What about this? Can we say anything about pianists based on what we know about otter hounds? Can we make any of these claims into other type of claims? How do they relate to each other? But more importantly, what are these different types of claims really about? Which of the terms do they tell us the most about? And do they tell us the most about every member? of that term, or maybe just some of the members of that term? Do our claims extend to every member of that term? Right? And it sh should be pretty obvious to you that no, when we say some musicians are prodigies, that doesn't extend to every member of these terms. right? Distribution can be threatening, and it's going to come a bit later, but just have that in your mind, because that's really all distribution is, is a matter of 
how far that claim extends across the members of the claim or of the expression maybe is a better way to put it okay let's go back to the textbook so as you may have guessed the phrases that go in the blanks are terms the ones that the one that goes in the first blank is the subject term of the claim and the one that goes into the second blank is the predicate term if you're not familiar with these names but it sounds like something you might learn in an English class that is okay typically we represent the subject with an S and the predicate with a P and you don't really need to know the grammatical significance of these I mean it's great if you do um, but it is just enough to know that the first one is S and the second one is P. I have added this to our notes and I highly recommend that you do as well. Right, so just as a note to this, the phrases that go in the blanks are terms, right? So you could have dogs or cats or snakes, right? Some snakes are not criminals, uh, <laughs> right? It might help you to. Um, change them I shouldn't capitalize right so that they match so that it's s and p if that helps you for your examples you can have quite a bit of fun with that um, trying to think of another s word um, I don't want to say Sally's let's try singers no singers are pianists Right, just to kind of get that structure of S and P into your mind. Uh, it might be a good exercise for you to make up your own, but hopefully you see what I'm doing uh, by just picking a, a, a noun uh, or a noun phrase that starts with an S for the first blank and uh, one that starts with a P for the second one. Just to familiarize you guys with this, it might seem silly, but it can be very, very helpful. And it's important to keep in mind only nouns and noun phrases will work as terms. Right? So, what does this mean? Let's look back. So, let's see, where is this in the textbook? Right? An adjective alone, such as red, won't do. All fire engines are red is not a standard form categorical claim because red by itself does not name a class of things. This is very important for the rest of this chapter. So you might be asking yourselves, well, I mean, red seems like a category of things. And I'd say that's, that's a good thing to say. What would I do with red? If I wanted to put it in categorical form, I would say some things that are red, right? Um, and now, and we will talk more about this later, so I wouldn't bother putting it in your notes just yet, although you might want to. Um, so, things that are red is doing the work here. In fact, Things is our noun, right? So now we have what we call a noun phrase. And this is just fine and dandy. But you can't just say some red, right? Um, that's not going to work. Some things that are red. Okay, let's go back to the textbook now that we've cleared that up. So now that we know how to express things in categorical logic, or at least how to classify uh, the claims, right? Uh, let's talk about what they mean and how to analyze them. There's a section on Venn diagrams here. <laughs> there are two methods for analyzing categorical claims. One method involves Venn diagramming. Now, I initially thought Venn diagramming was the more obvious way to analyze these claims. It seems more intuitive, but I found it's very difficult to test with 
and students tend to perform worse. So we are not going to use the Venn diagram method. We are going to use a different method. That being said, I still want to look at these very briefly uh, because they can be very helpful in conceptualizing some of these claims. So let's look at, this is a Venn diagram for an A type claim, which is an all S R P. What are we looking at here? If we're saying all S R P, it's very odd, but what we do is we shade the part of the Venn diagram that is unoccupied, not the part that is occupied. Very odd, right? So we can learn a few things by looking at this, right? This claim isn't saying anything about these remaining P's, right? These P's may exist, they may not exist. It is only saying that these S's do not exist and that these where S does exist, it is also a P. Very odd, but again, let's just look at this. We can't know fr from merely the claim, all singers are pianists, for example. That doesn't say anything about the remaining pianists, does it? Nah, not even a little. Um, it does say something about the singers who are not pianists, namely, that they do not exist, right? So. We've got this claim that encompasses all of this, even though it involves P, it doesn't say anything about those pianists who are not singers. I hope it's okay, but I'm going to uh, continue to use S and P terms. I might be boring and just use singers and pianists. Um, okay, figure two is an E type claim, which just to refresh your memory is no S R P, right? And again, Shading indicates that there are no members of this set, right? So this claim tells us something about this part of the Venn diagram and this part of the Venn diagram only, really, right? Um, there could be S's who are A, B, C's, and D's. Uh, these, these S's might not exist. They might exist. We don't know. Maybe S's don't exist at all, right? So... Um, no snakes are people, right? Uh, maybe there are also just no snakes. And maybe there are also just no people, right? Or maybe there are loads of snakes that are not people. All we can know from an E-type claim is that there are no snakes that are people. And that sounds silly, so maybe let's think of it again as singers and pianers, pianists, right? Uh, no singers are pianists. We would shade this part of the Venn diagram. This is what it's talking about. This is what an E-type claim tells us about. Okay. This is the figure for an I-type claim, right? Some snakes are people. I kind of agree with that, actually. Like, I've met some cool snakes. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, we indicate this with an X. Again, you don't need to necessarily remember how to draw these Venn diagrams. There is no way for me to do this with an online class. Hey, can you imagine an exam where you have to draw Venn diagrams? I don't even know how that would work. Um, but it's indicated with an X. And if you choose to look at the other methods of analyzing categorical claims, this will be incredibly important to know. Okay, and last one, uh, an O-type claim. Some S's are not P, right? So let's talk about what this O-type claim is discussing. Uh, does it tell us anything about P? Not really. We don't know. We can't occupy any of the P position. Um, some snakes are not politicians, let's say. That doesn't tell us anything about politicians. It just tells us something about some snakes, namely that some snakes are not politicians. There might be snakes that are politicians. We don't know from this O-type claim alone. It may help you to notice uh, this fundamental difference. Uh, A and I-type claims are affirmative, and E and O-type claims are negative. Right, which is just to say not, 
or in this other instance, no, right? That's all affirmative and negative means. Negative doesn't mean it's rude or uh, degrading to snakes or anything like that. It just means it says that none or not, right, or no. Okay, so if you want to forget about that, you can, but the things we talked about with regard to what these claims can tell us and what they cannot tell us is crucial. It is of the utmost importance. A brief preface before we get into uh, what I think is the most hilarious part of categorical logic, but uh, maybe the part that some of you hate the most. Um, so, although there are only four standard type claims, form type, standard form type claims, that would help if I could read, it's remarkable how versatile they are. A large portion of what we want to say can be written or translated into one or another of them. Because this task is sometimes easier said than done, we'd best spend a little while making sure we understand how to do it. This is what we're going to be engaged in. And as a disclaimer or a caveat, a lot of standard form translations are not pretty. In fact, I find them hilarious. But what we want is accuracy of our claims, not style. This is important so that when we begin to analyze these claims, we analyze them correctly. We understand what the claims and the arguments are about. So uh, you can put these in your notes. There are way too many of them <laughs> uh, for me to copy and paste all of them. But uh, let's just get right into it. So translating claims in which the word only or the phrase the only occurs. All right. So several things can happen with this. Let's look at this original claim, which is not in categorical form. Only sophomores are eligible candidates. Right? Uh, usually I would ask you guys to give it a go, try to translate this into a standard form, right? Remember, we only have four standard forms. We have to make this phrase fit into one of these forms. It has to start with all, no, some, some, or it has to have, and it has to have, I should say, two terms separated in this way, right? We're trying to jam this claim into one of these. What are we to do with it? Well, we can look at this. Only sophomores are eligible candidates. And uh, our instinct might be to think all sophomores are eligible candidates. But that's different in a meaningful way, right? If we were to Venn diagram these two claims, we'd see that they're claims about two very different populations, right? All eligible candidates are sophomores, right? If we were to Venn diagram this one, it would be a claim about the same group as this one, right? Uh, only sophomores are eligible candidates. So um, that doesn't mean that every single sophomore is indeed an eligible candidate right? Uh, maybe it's a grant contest or a scholarship contest and they only want sophomores, right? Uh, but maybe it's also a science grant or scholarship contest, right? So that doesn't mean that all sophomores are eligible candidates. In that case, it would only be science majors or something like that, in which case this would give us an incorrect translation, right? That would mean all of them. So if we look at this carefully, we can see that it should be translated, all eligible candidates are sophomores. Let's move on. <laughs> um, there's a rule right here, which I'm going to suggest that we do put in our notes. Okay, not that much. What? Okay. The word only used by itself introduces a predicate term of an A claim. And I'll try to 
bold these things for you uh, so that they stand out, but I, I can't promise I'll do it. Um, maybe we should bullet note this. Okay. These rules are not going to be perfect, but they will help you translate. Probably take that out. Okay, so only sophomores are eligible candidates, right? Which means the word only is introducing the predicate term, right? Only sophomores. So we know that sophomores is going to go right here in that predicate term slot of any one of these type claims, right? And we can see that our rule tells us to do exactly that. The word only used by itself introduces a predicate term of an A claim. If you're the type of student to want to follow a long list of rules, this is going to be very difficult for you. I encourage you instead just to think about the class that is being restricted, right? And that will make more sense momentarily. So let's look at this example in which only is not used by itself. It's used in a big, long sentence. So the only people admitted are people over 21. Here, the class being restricted is the class of people admitted, right? Every one of them has to be over 21. So we're, we are talking about all the people admitted. This doesn't mean all people in the world have to be over 21, right? Just on, every one of the people admitted. So we're going to translate that to all people admitted are people over 21. And again, not pretty, right? We're repeating people. It's just to make sure that we're actually using noun phrases. So our next rule um, that we're adding to our list applies here. The phrase the only introduces the subject term of an A claim. So let's get that in our notes, right? So that's what only by itself means and the only means. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. So the original here, only matinees are half price shows. And we've got this other original. Only matinees are the only half price shows. In this instance we have only on its own and in this instance we have the only, right? They're going to be translated the same way. All half price shows are matinees. And if we take a moment and think about this, only matinees are half price shows and matinees are the only half price shows, they're both just saying all the half price shows are matinees. Okay. I'm not going to move that slowly through the rest of them because I don't want this to be a three-hour video. So, translating claims about times and places. I always get nervous when I take logic exams. Looks like a claim about the speaker, but it's best seen as a claim about times or occasions. The speaker is saying every time I take a logic exam is a time I get nervous. So we're going to translate that pretty easily into this standard form. All times I take logic exams are times that I get nervous, right? Because again, we need to recognize what these claims are actually about, right? I realize that in plain English, we would say I is the subject of this sentence. The speaker is the subject of the sentence, but we don't just mean the thing that the sentence is about, it's a, it's a claim, right? And the class of things that's being discussed here is logic exams. Okay. Let's get our rule. Oh goodness, there's a lot of these. Um, the word whenever can be a good clue that you have a claim about time on not on, happening. Uh, 
Whenever Peg shows up, Dick gets nervous. The word whenever tells us two things, that we probably have a claim about times or occasions, and that the term it introduces will be the subject term. I'm going to add this to our notes. Oh, mercy. Times or occasions. Okay, there we go. So, places are handled very similarly. We should just highlight that. Um, similarly to times. This one is going to look stupid, you guys. <laughs> Uh, it's snowing everywhere in Massachusetts. This is about snow, and it's about today, but we're best seeing it as about places. Places where it's snowing and places in Massachusetts. Once you see it that way, it's easily translated into the standard form. All places in Massachusetts are places it is snowing. Okay. Oh, maybe this is better for our notes. See, I don't like that it's likely that it introduces the subject term of an A claim. It's not that easy. Let's put it in here anyway. Okay. It's a little bit tidier. Oh, and I forgot to do this for you guys. There we go. Okay, let's move on. Oh, this one's quite cute. Um, I can scroll down. Uh, the lamb goes wherever Bo Peep goes. Right, we've heard that song about little Bo Peep. Um, this clearly should translate as all places Bo Peep goes are the place are places the lamb goes. So to recap, the two rules of thumb in this section: whenever usually introduces the subject of an A claim about times, wherever usually introduces the subject of an A claim about places. If you want to get this one in our notes. And get that semicolon up there. Oh, wait. No, I did do wherever and whenever. Okay. They look too similar to me. All right. Very good so far. This is where you guys are going to maybe hate me. I, uh, I once had a student outburst during class uh, say that this was like a bad dad joke. <laughs> so, <laughs> translating claims about specific individuals. We're going to put this into our notes a little in advance of actually discussing what it means. Um, oh, mercy. There we go. Okay, claims about single individuals should be treated as A claims or E claims. This isn't great, right? This, again, if you're trying to just memorize all these rules rather than see the structure of the claims, you're going to struggle here because there are lots and lots of rules. And none of them, well, some of them are absolute, but most of them are not, right? Um, this one could be A or E. Here we have usually, right? These aren't perfect. Um, we have it's likely. So instead, actually look at what we're doing and think critically about what we're doing here. So, you guys ready for this? I hope so. Let's look at the, the claim, Aristotle is a logician. We all recognize that this is a claim. Right? It is factual. It is objective. Uh, Aristotle is a logician. That seems straightforward. <laughs> We're going to translate that as all people identical with Aristotle are logicians. So <laughs> whenever you have a claim about a single individual, you have to jam it into this noun phrase. It's 
always going to be universal because that one individual doesn't it's not like some of Aristotle is a logician right that would be a very strange claim um, like his foot or something so but we do need a noun phrase so all people identical with Aristotle are logicians gives us a noun phrase right here and then it gives us a noun right here logicians is a noun like your professor is a logician um, so <laughs> an amused logician at that um, the reason we can know it's going to be an a or an e claim I hope some of you are recognizing is because those are our universal ones right where we're making a claim about the totality of that category or that set of things well because this is about a human being and they are always the totality of themselves uh, it's always going to be one of those universal types not hard when you really think about it right uh, so let's look at this one very quickly Aristotle is not left-handed becomes the E claim no people identical with Aristotle are left-handed people um, you, you, I know it's annoying uh, you, you just want to say are left-handed but that is not a noun phrase so we've got to keep them together and why becomes obvious once we start uh, analyzing. So it's not just people that crop up in individual claims. So St. Louis is on the Mississippi. Translates to all cities identical with St. Louis are on the Mississippi. So mass nouns are a real problem. Uh, hopefully you guys know what mass nouns are. Um, there, it's, some people call them non-count nouns. Um, like you wouldn't have one water or one boiled okra. It's not really clear what I, I mean. Boiled okra is such a weird example. Um, I almost want to use water here right if you said one water what you would actually mean is one bottle of water or one cup of water and then you'd have a, a countable noun uh, but here we have a mass noun right this is just talking about a lump of something uh, mashed potatoes would work equally as well if you don't know what boiled okra is right so mashed potatoes um, although we've got the s on the end of potatoes so we kind of grammatically treat it I'm just going to confuse you guys. Um, Google mass nouns. Look into it. They're a strange beast, but we use them all the time. So let's look at this. Uh, boiled okra is too ugly to eat. Uh, it's a claim about a kind of stuff. The best way to deal with it is to treat it as a claim about examples of this kind of stuff. The present example translates into an A claim about all examples of the stuff in question so we end up saying this ridiculous thing all examples of boiled okra are things that are too ugly to eat so conversely if maybe we liked some boiled okra um, some of it was all right some of it wasn't so ugly maybe they've covered it with cheese I don't know uh, most boiled okra is too ugly to eat translates into an I type claim some examples of boiled okra are things that are too ugly to eat okay I am laughing a bit about how funny some of these translations are uh, they seem to make things overly complex or overly convoluted but the idea is that the system of analysis works perfectly so long as we can narrow it down to the structure so the first step or to the form the first step is getting these claims into that form and even though it's silly I hope you guys will agree that this original statement most boiled okra is too ugly to eat is best understood for analysis as some examples of boiled okra are things that are too ugly to eat that's a mouthful it seems awful but 
we're build we're making it a bit bigger before we reduce it into its purely structural form. Remember that this I claim will eventually look just like this. So we could just have some B represent boiled okra and well examples of boiled okra and you uh, represent things that are too ugly to eat and it fits right in here perfectly. So we've gone from this nasty mess that we don't really know how to analyze and doesn't really fit any form and yeah it had this middle stage uh, but we've ended up here which we definitely can analyze in an argument. It's important to recognize that none of the things we've seen yet have been arguments, they've just been claims. These claims, are, and eventually a conclusion, uh, will make up the premises and conclusion of our categorical syllogisms. Additionally, it's worth noting that you will be asked to do this on the exam. Uh, so, as we noted, it's not possible to give rules or hints about every kind of problem you might run into when translating claims into standard form categorical versions. This is not a complete set of rules, right? Uh, there is no complete set of rules for translation. There are several examples of translations down here that if you would like to check in the back of the book, I'd strongly suggest that. I'm not going to assign these as homework because I find them tedious and annoying. Um, and also some people just get them and then other people struggle more, especially English language learners, because this is clumsy and ugly and the exact opposite of what they've been taught. Quite rightly, <laughs> nobody speaks this way. Um, but if this isn't making sense just yet to you, just take a look at these and check any one that has a gold triangle next to it in the back of the book. It'll get pretty easy pretty quickly. We've finally arrived at categorical syllogisms themselves, because remember, syllogism is a two-premise, one-conclusion argument, and so far we've only been looking at individual claims. So you may want to put this in your notes, I don't know. A syllogism is a two-premise deductive argument. Yay! Spoiler alert, I should have said. Okay, a categorical syllogism in standard form is a syllogism whose every claim is a standard form categorical claim and in which three terms occur, occur exactly twice and in exactly two of the claims. Whew! Wow! So, take a moment with that. Let's study this example. All Americans are consumers. Some consumers are not Democrats. Therefore, some Americans are not Democrats. Notice how each of the three terms, Americans, consumers, and Democrats, occur exactly twice in exactly two different claims. So let's get this in our notes. Maybe we should label it first. I wonder what this will happen in this will happen with this font in this new program. There we go. Oh, oh! I'm going to use this from now on. That looks so much less terrible. Um, and I'm not putting the definition in here because you don't need to memorize it. So let's get this in here so we can do some actual highlighting and color coding. So I'm going to number these as well just because it's a good habit to be in. And conclusion. Okay, so we've got our term Americans. Let's do that in blue. We've got consumers, which is a second term. Uh, let's do that in yellow. Here's consumers again, so yellow, and our third term, Democrats. And we'll make that, oh, I don't even know what to do with that. Okay, there we go. That's a bit better. 
um, we'll make that green. So let's get Americans again, which we decided was blue. And Democrats, which we decided was green. I am so sorry. If that, I feel like that's going to burn everyone's eyes. I wonder if I can make it a little easier to read. There we go. That's a bit easier. Okay. I feel better about that. Just to make this even more complicated, we've got more labels. Uh, the major term is the term that occurs as the predicate term of the syllogism's conclusion. The minor term is the term that occurs as the subject term of the syllogism's conclusion. And here's the one we want to focus on. The middle term is the term that occurs in both of the premises, but not at all in the conclusion. That is... <laughs> That is noteworthy. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's see if we can identify the middle term. Right? So it's the term that occurs in both of the premises, but not in the conclusion. Okay, so it should be pretty apparent that consumers is our middle term. Hooray! <laughs> We've already touched on this a bit uh, because we of course looked at the fallacy of the undistributed middle and in learning about that we learned how to identify the middle term. This only occurs in categorical syllogisms. There are other logics that this is not going to occur in. Only categorical syllogisms means only things with these structures, right? With the A and the O and the I and the E, right? Um, right? Only here. You'd be amazed how many students give me categorical syllogisms in the wrong section of the final exam. Do not fall for that. This is one kind of logic, and propositional logic or sentiental logic is a different kind of logic. It's like if you tried to do calculus for a, an, an algebra exam or an arithmetic exam, right? Just like there are different types of math, there are different types of logics. Um, there are many different logics. And no matter how much Microsoft Word wants to tell me that that's a typo, it is not. There are different types. And for only for this type of logic do we have this middle term. Okay, I feel so nerdy ranting about that. Back to our textbook. In a categorical syllogism, each of the premises states a relationship between the middle term and one of the other terms. If both premises do their job correctly, that is, if the proper connections between S and P are established in the middle term, which sometimes we refer to as M, then the relationship between S and P stated by the conclusion will have to follow. That is, the argument is valid. That's a lot for our notes, but it is a powerful thing to realize. So let's put all of that in our notes. Or highlight all of it if you're following along in the textbook. I'm getting rid of the M because I never use that, so it's unrealistic expectations there, um, right? So the fallacy of the undistributed middle occurs because the proper connections between S and P have not been established via the middle term. So the relationship between S and P does not follow, right? Uh, or let's type up some other names for that. So I've just got some synonyms for uh, following. Oh, I'm sorry. I started typing up the ones for the fallacy of the undistributed middle, but this is not talking about this or about 
fallacies. This is talking about the right way to do things. So when we say something has to follow, that means it is guaranteed, it is certain, it is 100%. So we're going to begin by looking at these three candidates for syllogisms. And in fact, only one qualifies as a categorical syllogism. So I want you guys to actually look at these arguments on the page. Our first one is all cats are mammals, not all cats are domestic, therefore not all mammals are domestic. Number two, all valid arguments are good arguments, some valid arguments are boring arguments. <laughs> Oh, well, it's definitely true, that premise right there. Therefore, some good arguments are boring arguments. And number three, some people on the committee are not students. All people on the committee are local people. Therefore, some local people are non-students. Is anything jumping out at you guys? Hopefully you'll pause this video and see if you can identify what is wrong with two of these or identify the one that is right. I, uh, like our textbook authors, hope it's obvious that the second argument is the only proper syllogism. The first example has a couple things wrong with it. Neither the second premise nor the conclusion is in standard form. No standard form categorical argument begins with the word not. Right? Which, which one of these would it be? You know what, I don't want to go scrolling around. You guys go scrolling around. None of them do. And the predicate term must be a noun or a noun phrase. The second premise can be translated into some cats are not domestic creatures, and the conclusion into some mammals are not domestic creatures, and the result is a syllogism. The third argument is okay up to the conclusion, which contains a term that does not occur anywhere in the premises. Non-students. That one's the first one that jumps out at me. Right? You can't just go dropping new stuff in these arguments. They're structural. You can't introduce new stuff in the conclusion. Otherwise, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. You haven't established any relationship there. However, this argument can be turned into a proper syllogism by averting the conclusion producing some local people are not students. Okay. Finally, we get to analyzing. So we've skipped quite a bit ahead in the textbook. Um, I am on page 395 in the PDF. I'm not sure what the page number is. OK, there it is, uh, 272 uh, in the physical textbook. But uh, let's get started. So the rules method for testing validity. The content that I skipped was the Venn diagramming method. Again, you are free to learn it. Many people think it is more intuitive. Uh, I'm not opposed to it, but uh, it's, it's not as good. It's not as good. It's it, intuitive maybe, but I think it misses a lot of what's going on in categorical syllogisms and makes them a lot less fun. So. Not that any of this is probably fun to you guys. Um, so the textbook even says the diagram method for testing syllogisms for validity is intuitive, but there's a faster method that makes use of three simple rules. These rules are based on two ideas, the first of which has been mentioned already, affirmative and negative categorical claims. Right, we talked briefly about that. And I have mentioned the second idea many times. That idea is distribution. Sometimes I've, I've talked about universality and whether or not these claims extend to all members of a group. That's what we're talking about here. So terms that occur in categorical claims are either distributed or undistributed. Either the claim says something about every member of the class, the term names, or it does not. So let's put this in our notes, but I find it a little convoluted, to be honest. Um, distribution is simply uh, 
that help if I could type. I'm actually going to say of its class. Um, so let's, uh, oh, it won't turn that into an M dash. Oh, well. So this is, this, you know, talks about what a term being undistributed is uh, as well. Maybe we should just, here we go. Okay, so terms that occur in categorical claims are either distributed or undistributed. Either the claim says something about every member of the class the term names, or it does not. More simply, distribution is when a claim says something about every member of its class. Right? It's universal. So with these two ideas, we can analyze these things super easily. If you keep anything for your notes on your final exam, if you like have any page open, this is one page you're going to want to have open, right? So here we have this wonderful chart. I feel like I might even be able to let's see if I can. No, dang it. I thought maybe I could just click and drag it into the Word document. Well, I'll type it up for you. What we've done here is we've circled the terms that are distributed in each of these claims, which is to say the terms that say everything about the member it is describing, right? So with an A claim, all snakes are people, this says something about all snakes. That shouldn't be surprising. With an E claim, no snakes are people, this says something about all snakes, and about all people, namely that of all people, none of them are snakes. <laughs> um, so an I claim doesn't say anything about every member of S or P. No term is distributed in an I claim. And then an O claim, some snakes are not people, some S are not P. This says something about every member of P. There are actually some really incredible insights about language and claims and distribution when you get down to why some of the, like for example, why with the O claim, even though it says some, right, it does in fact actually say something about every member of P. You might be able to see it. If you can, good for you. Consider a career in logic. It's very rewarding. Um, let me type this up and put it in our notes. I understand that me putting it in the notes doesn't really help you guys very much because you'll still have to type it up if you want to put it in your notes, but we're going to be making reference to this because you will be making reference to it uh, on your exam and when you do your homework. So we're just, get this somewhere, somehow. I just screenshot it. So now we just have our three rules. The number of negative claims in the premise must be the same as the number of negative claims in the conclusion. And when you think about this, this makes sense because the conclusion is always one claim, and this implies that no valid syllogism has two negative premises, right? Um, we can talk more about that if you'd like, but I don't want to make the longest lecture video ever, so I'm just going to... This is why I haven't used Microsoft Word before. I've used LibreOffice uh, because this is just obnoxious. Okay, uh, our second rule, at least one premise must distribute the middle term. This is the tough one, but it's pretty easy once you understand what the middle term is. And our third rule, any term that is distributed in the conclusion of the syllogism must be distributed in its premises. I think maybe I shouldn't have trash-talked uh, Microsoft Word because now it's angry at me. So the reason number two is the most difficult is because it uses two new concepts to us. But we're college students, so it's okay, right? Well, we're all adults um, and well acquainted with college, so we can learn two new things. That's not asking too much. 
We know that distribution just means, you know, it says something about every member of its class, right? Um, we've got this handy chart to help us with that. And we know that the middle term is just the term that occurs in both premises, but not the conclusion. Not too difficult. So what we do to use these, I just realized it's a different font size. Maybe it's 11? Yes, okay. Um, what we do when we want to analyze a syllogistic argument is check these three rules against the argument, or check the argument against these three rules. So let's just get right down to it, and I will demonstrate how this works. So let's hope this copy and paste works. All right. And again, I'm going to number these just to make life easier. And our conclusion. Right? So, that's nicer. All right. <laughs> um, so, let's just highlight things as we go through them, right? So, the number of negative claims in the premises must be the same as the number of negative claims in the conclusion. Well, this isn't a negative claim. Right? This doesn't have no or not in it. Some keyboard players are not percu percussionists, so we've got one here. Right? Maybe we want to make that red. And some pianists are not percussionists, so we can make that red as well. Well, does it pass this test? The number of negative claims in the premises must be the same as the, no, as the number of negative claims in the conclusion. Well, yes, it does. Um, this might help make it more apparent. Right? So we've separated the premises from the conclusion. That's all that is. It's like an equal sign in, uh, in mathematics, right? I've just drawn a line. Um, okay. So we can see that those are the same. And for this, I just like to smiley face. All right. Passed the, the test. Uh, we can highlight it in green if we want to. At least one premise must distribute the middle term. Well, we know how to do this. We're just going to look at our distribution chart, and we're going to identify the middle term. So we know that the middle term is the term that occurs in both premises, but not in the conclusion. We should see right away that this middle term is, let's use yellow, um, is players, right? Well, specifically keyboard players, if we're being really fussy about it. Let's be fussy. Okay, so we've identified our middle term. Let's see if it is distributed. Well, we can see that premise 1 is an A-type claim, right? All SRP. And we can see that pianists is the distributed term here. So... Not good. Not looking good. But we still have another premise we can look at, right? So some keyboard players are not percussionists. I just realized I never actually read the argument to you guys, but that's because content doesn't matter. Okay, some keyboard players are not percussionists. All right, what type of claim is this? We can see that it's an O-type claim. Oh, no. So the term that is distributed here is percussionists in an O-type claim. I would circle it for you guys if I could, but unfortunately, Word just doesn't allow me to do that. No. Doesn't pass this test. Do we need to go further? Wait, that's not what I wanted to do. We do not need to go further. That's a stop sign. This is an invalid categorical syllogism. If it's gratifying to you, or you can just say, because it breaks rule two. Right? But what if we had gone on? I should probably show you guys, and this is just for the sake of argument, um, we already know this is an invalid categorical syllogism. Right? or an invalid deductive argument. Um, 
But let's see how we would check this third rule. Any term that is distributed in the conclusion of the syllogism must be distributed in its premises. Right? So let's find our distribution here. Some pianists are not percussionists. We can see that that is also an O-type claim. So percussionists is distributed. So any term that is distributed in the conclusion of the syllogism must be distributed in its premises. Okay, that's fine. It would pass this one. But we didn't even need to go that far because we knew it failed because of rule two. I hope the happy, happy faces aren't too juvenescent. Like, it, it's a bit ridiculous, but I, I find it very effective, right? We know that this breaks rule two. This is tedious and annoying, but my word, how powerful is that? You can take any claim, well, not any claim, because some claims don't convert into categorical syllogisms, but you can take any claim, that series of claims that be, can be converted into syllogistic reasoning, categorical syllogistic reasoning, and translate it, look at it like this, check it against these, and forever defeat it. It's dead. That argument does not exist anymore. We obliterated it, right? That is just incredibly powerful. We didn't even actually take the time to read this argument. We might have been able to look at it and know whether it was valid or invalid just by looking at it. Let's check. All pianists are keyboard players. Some keyboard players are not percussionists. Therefore, some pianists are not percussionists. Maybe you didn't have any feelings about that. Um, you know, it's not as obvious as the examples of, like, dogs biting people and such that the textbook has used up until now. Well, we can know for certain that this is invalid, and it's invalid because it breaks rule two. Let's go back to the textbook and hope I did that correctly because that would be embarrassing. The term keyboard board players is the middle term, and it is undistributed in both premises, right? That's what we talked about right here. The middle term is not distributed. I've underlined distributed terms and highlighted the middle term. The first premise in A claim does not distribute its predicate term. The second premise in O claim does not distribute its subject term. So the syllogism breaks rule two. All right, everybody, that is everything we're learning today. Uh, fortunately, I kept it within regular class time, so apologies that that was a bit lengthy. Um, there is homework on this, and this is on the midterm exam. If you hate this, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not a big fan of categorical logic either. Um, I don't find it super rewarding, but it's pretty easy once you do it a handful of times. Just keep those rules in front of you and think about how we use language and what our claims actually mean. Uh, it is a powerful tool. So welcome to introduction, everybody. All right, I will see you next week.